Hi, thank you everyone so much for joining our PRS Grand Rounds tonight. We will start momentarily. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for PRS Grand Rounds tonight. We'll be talking about targeted muscle re for the treatment of painful neuromas. We're waiting for a few more people to log on and we'll start momentarily. Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another PRS Grand Rounds. Uh, if you can advance to the next slide, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone, to PRS Grand Rounds. Uh, you can read free articles on this topic on the prsjournal.com as well as prsglobalopen.com. Just go to one of these websites and look for that PRS Grand Rounds logo, and you can find the free collection of articles uh, to learn more. Next slide. As a reminder, our PRS Grand Rounds is a multiple national award winner, so thank you to all lecturers and participants tonight. All lecturers and article collections are archived at prsjournal.com, so be sure to check out past uh, evenings. Uh, tonight we're talking about targeted muscle re for the treatment of painful neuromas. As a reminder, there'll be uh, about a 30-minute lecture followed by a 30-minute Q&A session. Feel free to ask questions by commenting on this Facebook Live video throughout the lecture. There'll be the immediate uh, Q&A period following the lecture, so please ask questions. Uh, succinct questions are preferred, about 120 characters, which will enable us to show them on screen and make them more likely to be selected. Um, if you'd like to post comments, you can post those separately. Um, so tonight we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Gregory Dumanian for our PRS Grand Rounds. Dr. Gregory Dumanian is the Chief of the Division of Plastic Surgery and Lucille and Orion Studeville Professor of Surgery at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. He completed his general surgery training at the Massachusetts General Hospital and plastic surgery training at the University of Pittsburgh, followed by a fellowship in hand surgery at the Curtis Hand Center in Baltimore, Maryland. He has worked at Northwestern Memorial Hospital since 1996, during which he has become known for his contributions to abdominal wall reconstruction, development of the first new surgical suture in 30 years called Duramesh Suturable Mesh, and pioneering work in targeted muscle re -innervation. Dr. Dumanian created the TMR procedure in 2001 for improved prosthetic control of a bilateral shoulder disarticulation patient and has gone on to revolutionize the management of neuroma pain in both amputee and non-amputee patients. So without further ado, I will turn the lecture over to Dr. Dumanian. 
Thank you, Dr. Jaynes. Uh, thank you, PRS, for allowing me to speak on this uh, grand rounds on a topic that uh, I find uh, near and dear, targeted muscle re uh, I'm a consultant for uh, Checkpoint Surgical, and this work was supported in part by a DOD grant. Jesse Sullivan uh, was a 54-year-old electric lineman when in 2001 he had a 7200 volt burn, and he had an immediate bilateral shoulder, shoulder disarticulation. And here we are back in 2002, the state-of-the-art prosthetic. It's clumsy, it's slow, it's got these chin switches that are really uncomfortable and shoulder switches. But the main thing is that you can't control prosthetic elbow and prosthetic hand at the same time because clumsy shoulder muscles are being used to either signal the elbow or signal the hand. It's not intuitive and it's slow. And so Dr. Todd Kaiken and I had this idea that we could take this one clumsy pectoralis signal and make it into four smart signals with a set of nerve transfers. What do I mean by that? Well, it's, TMR is a surgical technique where you take this large amputated nerve, you cut off the neuroma, go back to healthy fascicles, find a muscle segment that's under cortical control with the motor nerve, divide the motor nerve, now you have this denervated piece of muscle, and then take this large proximal mixed nerve and sew it right to that small motor nerve. That's TMR. A little bit more globally, what's TMR? So here's a shoulder disarticulation patient with this pectoralis major still connected to the brain. We're cutting those small motor nerves to muscle segments of the pectoralis. Now you have four denervated segments. We're moving the major mixed nerves that used to serve the arm. And with successful re you have four newly re muscle segments, but not the pectoralis signal, now they're being signaled by either the muscutaneous, radial, median, and ulnar nerves. For the pictures of Jesse Sullivan, we mobilized the neuromas, divided the pectoralis into muscle segments, and this created distinct segments of pectoralis muscle. And uh, this was the uh, final finished picture. There are not many pictures from Jesse. I was fighting with my chief resident the entire case who said this was the stupidest thing that he had ever done and there was no way this would work. That's a true story. Open. This is Jesse about four relax. months later. Close, relax, open, relax, close, relax, elbow up, relax, elbow down, relax, elbow up. We're not relax. asking these. Elbow down. We're not asking these muscle segments to move a prosthetic. We are asking these muscle segments to give a signal that can be picked up with a sticky electrode transcutaneously to then signal the prosthetic of what to do. And here is Jesse with the same prosthetic, prosthesis, but now with better signaling. On the left, he had used that pre-op one for 20 months, and on the right, after TMR, better signaling and now it can move his prosthetic elbow and prosthetic hand at the same time. And even better, it's intuitive. He th uses, he thinks I'm going to close this terminal device, his median nerve fires, it's picked up by the pectoralis, and it closes the prosthetic. One of the great things about TMR, there's no microscope here. This is all macro surgery. So who's a candidate? No plexus injury. These nerves that we're transferring have to be still connected to the brain and you need a nearby muscle that's under cortical control. Another indication for doing the surgery is decreased pain or improved prosthetic function, like I will discuss in the next section. This young lady had a motorcycle accident. She's on her side. We used the old incision. There are the nerves that used to go to her arm. And then from inside the wound, we found the motor nerves to the clavicular head of the pectoralis, the sternal heads, we cut back to healthy fascicles, which is a standard nerve, peripheral nerve procedure. Here are the coaptations. This gentleman had a, a radiation as a child and got a post-radiation sarcoma 20 years later. There's the uh, tumor in his humerus. 
and we did some spare part surgery, Dr. Jason Souza and I, taking his forearm, which was still with good nerves and good motor end plates. And then we co-opted those to the brachial plexus level nerves at the level of his clavicle. And close your elbow. At the elbow. elbow. Many months later. Okay, wiggle your fingers. So this free flap was used not only to accept the axons of the cut brachial plexus level nerves, but to also to close Bend the wound. Wrist, up and down your wrist. For the transhumeral level, you have the biceps and the triceps. And so for a transhumeral amputation, the biceps is an intuitive signal for elbow flexion. And we're going to steal one of those heads of the biceps and transfer the median nerve to it. Again, here's the triceps, which is a good elbow extension signal for the prosthesis. We're going to leave one of the heads of the triceps alone and take the lateral head of the triceps and transfer the distal aspect of the radial nerve that used to go to the for hand opening and wrist extension and transferring that motor nerve to the lateral head of the triceps. So here we're doing a transhumeral amputee. He lost his arm due to COVID. He's prone right now, so this is the back of his arm. We're making this incision. Distal radial nerve. That's the distal Most radial nerve. nerve. Nothing happens. Motor nerve, lateral triceps. And then the motor nerve to the lateral triceps got a great signal. So here's some marks. You can see where I'm going to be cutting the nerve. This is the distal radial nerve. It's bigger. Here is the motor nerve to the lateral head of the triceps, essentially doing a step cut, no tension. And that's the first coaptation, the radial nerve to the motor nerve of the tricep, one of the heads of the triceps. Now we split supine position a kind of unusual incision to split the heads of the biceps. Sorry, motor nerve of medial biceps, motor nerve of lateral biceps. So there the, the uh, muscular motor cutaneous nerve, nerve gives off those motor nerves to the medial and lateral heads. Here's the median nerve. Here's that motor nerve to the medial head of the biceps. I'm going to give you a close-up in a second. Motor nerve to the medial biceps, median nerve, step cut, and then here's the coaptation. Two stitches of 6O or 7O polypropylene suture, no microscope, just loops. A little bit more distally, he had a long arm, so we found his ulnar nerve, and here is a mo the motor nerve to the brachialis. And again, a step cut and uh, an easy coaptation. So here's a patient, transhumeral amputee, before TMR, after TMR, he has clumsy hand opening and closing because he doesn't have his median and distal radial nerves firing and giving a signal to his prosthetic. Post-op, he can move his elbow and his hand at the same time. Smooth and intuitive, and most importantly, it's faster. But there's another level that these transfers are not just on-off signals that you can look at the sea or the lawn of EMG activity through the skin to get multiple patterns of movement for your prosthesis. This is Jesse again with about 80 electrodes on his chest to pick up all the various types of signals. And you can see that he can get individual finger motion for an experimental arm. To this day, TMR is the only system that can get this kind of prosthetic control without wires going from inside the body, outside the body. And so while all those systems are very exciting to think about, to even get more information from the nervous system, TMR at this point, because the muscle acts as a nerve amplifier, is the only thing that is feasible and usable in 2021. These are the types of electrodes, sensing electrodes that are on the shell of a device so that you can get both elbow and hand at the same time for a transhumeral amputee. There we go. So why had no one tried this? I mean, it's because of these cut nerves and the size mismatches. I was going to various, uh, 
you know, giving it very meetings and various meetings and everyone kept saying there's going to be pain, there's going to be pain. I mean, this is a model to create painful neuromas. Something like this. This is a uh, saphenous nerve. Here's the small motor nerve to a sartorius. I mean, look at those size differences. I'm pointing at the large uh, sensory nerve and I'm sewing it to or co-opting it to a small motor nerve. I mean, look at that size mismatch. Well, Jason Souza, I mentioned him earlier, went and looked at our first 28 patients. 54 of them had pain preoperatively, and only one had pain postoperatively in a nerve that we hadn't even treated. So what happens to neuromas with TMR? This is Dr. Peter Kim's work, where we made little rabbit amputees, created neuromas, did a rectus flap, and then did three nerve coaptations to the median, ulnar, and radial nerves. A couple months later, Medium. successful re radial. Ulnar. Median. Radial. Ulnar. And he showed in this set of uh, five rabbits that after TMR, sorry, after nerve injury and neurotomy, fiber area goes down because of sprouting. TMR with successful re enlarges fiber area back towards normal. And the same thing with myelinated fiber count. With neurotomy, sprouting, axon numbers go up. After successful TMR and re axon numbers go down. This is healing the end of the nerve, not uh, and, and that uh, brings the nerve back to its pre, towards its pre-injury uh, histology. And that's what the histology looks like. Axon, myelinated axons, disorganized chaos, myelinated axons again. So we came up with the slogan that TMR gives the nerve somewhere to go and something to do. It's healing the nerve. So we did a single blinded, randomized clinical trial comparing TMR to the standard, which is muscle burying. So you have a amputated nerve and you cut off the neuroma and hide it in a, quote, healthy muscle. We looked at 14 standard patients, 15 limbs, and we compared them to 14 TMRs and 15 limbs. One year we had three crossovers. So I'm showing 15 standard patients and 18 TMRs who are comparing their pain and phantoms before and after surgery. This is what the two limbs look like, hiding the end of a nerve versus trying to heal an end of a nerve. We used a numeric rating scale. And limb pain, include all the patients, including the crossovers, bearing did not statistically improve pain, while TMR statistically improved uh, limb pain, and these patients did not know what treatments they had. But more interestingly, with phantoms, bearing the end of a nerve under an innervated muscle, phantoms were actually increased from the preoperative level, while to our knowledge, TMR is the first treatment to improve a phantom pain. We also had 35, 33 patients, 35 limbs that refused to be randomized or wanted improved prosthetic control, and they showed the exact same types of relationships of improvements of residual limb pain and phantom pain. Interestingly, their function was improved by, by patient-reported outcomes, probably through a pain mechanism for both upper and lower limbs. Uh, this is a, one of those patients. He had uh, upper limb amputation, a very painful ulnar nerve neuroma, which was right there. His radius was sticking out of his soft tissues, so we wanted to do a free flap. Mm -hmm. I did this with Dr. Jason Coe, my partner in crime. You can see a long ulnar nerve right here. Mm -hmm. We did an ALT flap to the median nerve, and we did his ulnar nerve to the medial head of the biceps. He was, this gentleman was on lots of narcotics preoperatively over a year out. He's got great innervation. His motion has been maintained. He's back at work and off of meds. Here's another of the study patients. Um, these are the types of incisions we do for transradial amputations in TMR. There are his motor nerves of his brachialis. 
uh, going brachioradialis going to his median nerve. Here's a vessel loop uh, around his ulnar nerve going to a motor nerve of the FCU. You can do this for digital nerve neuromas. This was a clinic facelift patient, and preoperatively she had she was like, "Hey, is there anything you can do? I've had these neuromas to my index finger cut back twice before." So we did a clinic facelift, and then uh, uh, the common digital nerves to the index finger to motor nerves of her intrinsics, and her pain completely resolved. We've done TMR at the time of a major limb amputation. This is Dr. Cheeseboro uh, with Ruben Bueno at SIU. Dr. Cheeseboro was my resident, and she was doing a rotation at SIU, and a patient came there with an arm disarticulation, and they did the first acute TMR. And what's the data for acute TMR? The general population, 21% has no pain, and that increases to 45% with acute TMR. Severe pain drops from 33% down to 18%. And same sorts of things for residual limb pain, from 19% to 49% with no pain, and for severe pain drops from 32% to 17%. This young lady had her arm uh, ripped off in a car accident. She came within two weeks of her amputation. You can see the fresh sutures of her uh, limb loss. <laughs> That's her uh, motor nerve of her uh, pectoralis. Those are her uh, nerves to her brachial plexus. They're pretty easy to find uh, in the acute state. And that was one of the nerve coaptations we did. This lady, you can do these for cancer. She had this horrible melanoma of her elbow. And does it matter what you do in terms of what nerve goes to where? No, it's what reaches without any tension. So this was the middle branch of the pectoralis major that got the median nerve. Here is some residual motor nerve to the residual triceps, and that got another nerve coaptation. So we found all the nerves and found five motor nerves using a stimulator and did nerve coaptations. This was not for prosthetic control, this was for pain. And there's another one. And she had no pain uh, all the way to the uh, end of her life for that limb. This young gentleman fell down an elevator shaft, gruesome injury. A Couple days later, we took him back to the operating room. He had not ripped his nerves out of his plexus. He ripped his nerves out of his forearm. So we found some motor nerves in the biceps and triceps. Sewed him up. All right, the phantom pain uh, for the most part is gone. Occasional phantom pain, but very rarely. And the local pain is gone pretty much altogether. This young lady lost her hand due to an unresectable sarcoma, and uh, we did a bunch of nerve coaptations. The forearm is rich with motor nerves to the AIN, FDS, FDP, uh, uh, pronator. And so really it's what reaches what, what's close by, what's the least amount of work uh, to get the uh, major nerve to a small motor nerve. What about the lower extremity? This gentleman had, had lost his left leg uh, from a, a cancer many years earlier, and we uh, divided his sciatic nerve neuroma and went to the motor nerves of the medial, excuse me, the superior and inferior gluteal. And that was one of the nerve coaptations right there. Uh, for uh, above knee amputations, that's the sciatic nerve with motor nerves to the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and the biceps femoris. Pretty easy to find at the junction of the proximal third and middle third of the uh, humor of the femur. Here's another case. Maybe there's a sciatic nerve, and those are the motor nerves to the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus. This gentleman had a uh, sarcoma resected. He had his uh, he had horrible perineal pain that was resected, uh, and so he had his perineal neuroma here and his tibial nerve down here. And so we were just treated the perineal nerve. You recording? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did the coaptation. This gentleman was interesting because before surgery, his tibial nerve showed no discomfort. But when you took away the pain of the perineal nerve, 
the tibial nerve then, quote, became painful. And it's almost like one of these gate theories or something. When you have something that's super painful, you don't notice everything else that's around you. So when the perineal nerve became pain-free, the tibial nerve, quote, became painful. I call that unmasking. And because of this gentleman who had zero pain in his tibial nerve at the time of this surgery, and after I treated his perineal nerve, his tibial nerve became painful. I, for amputees, I treat all the painful nerves at the same time. For the saphenous nerve, this is a really fun coaptation as the saphenous nerve uh, comes out of Hunter's Canal. And inside the fascia, there, over the vastus medialis, there's a beautiful motor nerve. That's the saphenous nerve. That's the motor nerve of the vastus medialis. And that's a really easy transfer where the, edge, the uh, sizes actually match up. This uh, gentleman had a exposed uh, total uh, knee, he lost his patellar tendon. I thought that the limb was unsalvageable for many reasons. And here uh, in this knee disarticulation. We're going to pick up the perineal nerve. Common perineal. And then we're and, going to pick up. And that's going the to the motor nerve, nerve of the lateral uh, gastroc. And his tibial and nerve is going to the motor nerve of the medial gastroc. And he healed and he's doing beautifully. Baloney amputations is unfortunately where most of the amputee world is in terms of numbers. We make a posterior calf incision. That's the motor nerve to the lateral gastroc. That's the common perineal nerve. I do the common perineal nerve to the motor nerve of the lateral gastroc. Now, in deep within the, between the heads of the gastrocnemius, the distal tibial, and that's the motor nerve of the soleus, and there's a, adjacent to it the motor nerve of the flexor hallucis longus. And this is all on a PRS in a review article Dr. Lanier and I wrote, and there's a, uh, a video, but here is the uh, motor nerve, excuse me, here is the uh, tibial nerve to the motor nerve of the soleus, here is the common perineal nerve, and that's going to be co-opted to the motor nerve of the lateral gastrocnemius muscle. And typically, we'll take the uh, sural nerve down to the FHL. Unfortunately, some people who have unreconstructable ankle injuries would prefer a prosthetic. Uh, with an amputation to their bad ankle that's in chronic pain. So in the prone position, sometimes I'll do a baloney amputation and then TMR behind the calf at the same time. And this guy was trouncing around Europe in his prosthetic and was loving life after uh, removing his pain, chronically painful ankle. But again, we started with prosthetic control just in upper extremities. Then we went to upper and lower extremities for both control of prosthetics and pain and phantoms. Well, what about neuromas not in amputees? You don't have to be an amputee to have this procedure. Any painful nerve can be treated with this uh, idea to give the, the newly cut nerve somewhere to go and something to do. This lady had this horrible sarcoma. She had a sarcoma. It was resected. We were waiting for margins, and during that time, you know, her radial nerve was resected. You could see, imagine it being right there, and she was in horrible, disabling radial nerve pain. She couldn't have cared less about her wound. So I was doing a uh, distally based radial forearm. I was kind of do it origami style to cover this and to close this primarily, but at the same time, that's her. That's where her cut radial nerve was. But at the here is her radial nerve. At the same time I'm doing this, you can find the motor nerve of the brachioradialis. That's the wound that I closed with her uh, radial forearm. And there, the motor nerve of the brachioradialis is immediately adjacent to the, uh, set uh, the sensory nerve, the radial sensory nerve. So step cut, two stitches, and I know that uh, she had completely re she had resolution of all of her pain. Now, this may be controversial, but the quality of the pain relief with TMR in my hands is better than the quality of the pain relief trying to do a reconstruction. So while some 
or many surgeons would say, gosh, I should have taken the uh, sural nerve from the leg and then reconstructed her radial nerve. Over the years, I've been going away from nerve reconstruction and just satisfying the end of the nerve upstream with TMR. So maybe controversial, but that's where I'm moving to. This gentleman had his sural nerve removed for a facial animation and had horrible pain of his sural nerve. That's why, you know, cutting and harvesting a sural nerve is not a completely innocuous procedure. And so then we get to really simple, of all the operations, this one, I'm not sure okay, if I had a failure with it, but I take the uh, sural nerve and uh, co-opt it to the motor nerve of the lateral gastrocnemius muscle. And this guy, post-op, I saw him several years out, no pain, walking around, doing great. Here's a chronic superficial perineal nerve neuroma. Right here, after an arthroscopy, you can see all the atrophy she's had on her foot from all the cortisone shots that have been tried um, outside. And maybe a bunch of years ago, I would have tried to reconstruct this with an allograft. But I really think that um, digging out the perineal nerve and coapting it, superficial perineal nerve, and coapting it, in this case, to the motor nerve of the extensor hallucis longus. And uh, uh, she postoperatively has done just great. It is, was walked into the office and hadn't done that walking in a long time. Well, inguinal painful, inguinal nerve pain, you know, I, I do a lot of abdominal wall reconstruction, and 5 to 8% of all men who have an inguinal hernia repair will have chronic uh, uh, ilioinguinal nerve pain from the nerve being wrapped up in the overlying mesh. Here is an ilioinguinal nerve that's been cut back twice. I just, you just follow the nerve back toward the anterior superior iliac spine. Invariably, there's a small motor nerve that goes to the internal oblique. Step cut, two seven-o-choline sutures, and these patients invariably do very well. Uh, this lady uh, had uh, chronic pain after a C-section. I tried a nerve allograft. Um, uh, two years later, uh, the nerve allograft really had failed. I, you could see the nerve allograft in a couple stitches right there. If you follow the ilioinguinal nerve back toward the anterior superior iliac spine, there'll be a motor nerve right about here. And you follow the, uh, with the nerve stimulator. There's the motor nerve right there. And that's a two-stitch uh, repair. I'm getting near the end. What about the occipital nerve? I know everybody's trying, everybody uh, does uh, decompressions. Um, I just, in my hands, a TMR gives a better quality of pain relief. I mean, I'm going for no pain as opposed to, yeah, it's better. So if you follow the uh, occipital nerve back toward the erector spinae, just like in the groin here, it, these, quote, pure sensory nerves throw off a motor nerve before they exit the muscle. Here's a humongous occipital nerve. And here is the motor nerve that comes off of it. So I divided the occipital nerve and did a nerve coaptation. Give the nerve somewhere to go and something to do. Channel healing to a denervated bed. So for 2021, prevent pain at the time of an amputation with acute TMR. Or if you're doing a tumor resection and you have free nerve endings, give it somewhere to go and something to do rather than trying to hide it. Heal the nerve if you can. Treating the nerve with TMR gives the nerve somewhere to go, something to do, and hiding the neuroma is just not supported with level one data. And with that, um, I wanna go back to Dr. James. Thanks so much, Dr. Dumanian, for such an awesome lecture. Um, as a reminder to everyone who tuned in a little bit late, make sure to check out our uh, collection of articles that can be read for free on prsjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com. You just go to one of those websites and you can look for the PRS Grand Rounds logo and it should link you to the collection of free articles um, on TMR. 
you can go to the next slide. Um, so our Q&A is off to a great start. Thanks to everyone for posting some great questions. As a reminder to everyone, um, our Q&A portion will be about 30 minutes. Um, make sure you ask questions succinctly under 120 characters as preferred. This will enable us to show them on screen and make them more likely to be selected. So while uh, the comments are coming in, I can start us off with a quick question. Um, Dr. Dumanian, can you talk a little bit more about what you tell patients to expect in their recovery and the time course until pain relief after TMR surgery? Uh, yes, but first uh, I want you guys to know who I am. So, I, you know, there are all these pictures in the background. So that is the <laughs> village uh, my grandparents were from in historic Armenia. Uh, here's a picture of Jesse. So that was uh, when we were really starting this. Uh, there's Steve Bernard is in there and Bruce Mass. That's my pit residency photo. I don't know if they have our residency photos in their office. Uh, where is this? Uh, this one is uh, TJ Berry, who was my co-resident in hand surgery at Curtis. So uh, <laughs> anyway. um, and hi, mom. I think my mom is watching. So, OK, uh, time course. Uh, painful nerves uh, tend to go to sleep. That's what I tell people. So for a day or two or a week, they're like, oh, doctor, you're like the best doctor ever. And I was like, don't worry, this painful nerve is going to wake up. It usually wakes up, gosh, two days, five days after surgery. That first visit in the office, patients have two issues. Number one, they think, boy, this really didn't work. And number two, they have dysesthesias if they're, you know, if they're non-amputees. So if you take a superficial perineal nerve and co-opt it to a motor nerve of the perineus longus or the EHL, then they have this zone of dysesthesia. And even though I tell them about it preoperatively, they're not ready for it. They think, oh, you cut a nerve, you have numbness, you're all great. So dysesthesias tend to get better with time. It usually is in the first one to four weeks. Patients should touch it more as opposed to touching it less. Going back to the amputees, um, phantoms, an established phantom takes six months to really get better. Okay. Uh, good time course, you see them in a week, you hold their hand. By two, three weeks, when you walk in the room, they smile and they see you, you know that you've got it. TMR tends to get better with time. And so if they get that, they, they're off that hump after two, three weeks and they smile when you come in the room and they stop talking about their dysesthesias and they're rubbing their uh, residual limb more, you know you're in the right direction. Awesome. Um, so our next question uh, will come up on the bottom of the screen here. It's from Samir Halani, and he is wondering, how do you approach spreading the word about TMR to other specialties, and what percentage of these do you perform immediately versus delayed? Um, it's, uh, okay, so how do you spread the word? It's finding the amputee surgeons and the PMR docs. To the amputee surgeons, you say, hey, I'll close for you, but let me just do this amputation. Uh, let me do this uh, nerve thing because there's level one evidence that it helps. Um, then you, uh, there's, a, there's a great paper that will be coming out on PRS um, looking at baloney amputations that life is almost statistically improved at one year um, with uh, uh, TMR. So, you know, their pain's less, they're walking better, and, you know, we're gonna have really close data that, you know, lifetime is, expand, is, is extended. So as the data keeps coming out, I think it'll be easier and easier to uh, convince people. In terms of delayed, um, that's knowing your prosthetists and getting the word out to local prosthetists that, hey, if you have a patient who has heterotopic ossification, deficient skin, and or pain and phantom limb, send them my way. Let's work on the residual limb in various aspects to make them better uh, prosthetic rehabilitation patients. So there are lots of different ways. In my practice, um, I'd say Half of the patients I do have are, are just painful nerves around the body. Maybe 25% are acutes, usually from surgical oncology or from vascular, and 25% are chronics. Um, I had a patient from uh, Indianapolis today who, um, no names of course, uh, but needed both uh, work on the shape and size of her limb and with TMR. So you have to uh, offer all those sorts of procedures. Awesome. 
We'll head to our next question, which is from uh, Samid Bustos. He'd like to know what special considerations should we take into account for post-operative care, rehabilitation or physical therapy in a patient who underwent TMR? Wow, um, you know, there's nothing specific about TMR other, outside of what you need to know for the care of the amputee. So get rid of swelling. These shrinkers, which are, you know, like uh, white tube socks that have circumferential compression and compression at the very end of the residual limb. You have to find a source for those things because even at Northwestern, all the years I've been here, we don't carry shrinkers. So an ACE bandage just really isn't adequate to stay on a residual limb and to keep swelling out. You have to counsel the patients about how long they won't, especially for lower extremities, how long they won't be in their prosthetic. So the more work you're planning to do, the longer they're gonna be out of their uh, prosthetic device. And so they need wheelchairs or you know crutches. So that's super important. But what's great about TMR is that the prosthetist, if you're doing it for prosthetic control, can figure out what you've done postoperatively by looking for the EMG signal. So for a transhumeral, they're going to find where the hand closing signal is the best. That's where they put their electrode. You don't have to tell them anything. You don't have to do anything. So um, TMR really does not change how you take care of the patients postoperatively or rehab, but you do need a little comfort in the trajectories of nerve pain and giving neuroleptics like, um, you know, gabapentin and neurontin uh, to help treat them. Awesome. Our next question is coming to us from, let's see, Jenny Cheeseborough, a Northwestern alum and familiar face. Hi, Jenny. Um, Dr. Dumanian, as wonderful a uh, wonderful lecture. Are you offering TMR in contaminated fields like a gangrenous limb amputation or necrotizing soft tissue infection being treated with amputation? Hi, Jenny. Great question, but uh, no, no, no. Uh, standard principles. Let's figure out what we're fighting. Something like that. You're fighting getting healing, so you can do all the sorts of things to get good healing, and you can always do early TMR within the first two, three weeks. And then it's easy because then you can go prone if you're doing a BKA and you have some sort of you know bad limb distally, you can get the distal aspect of their BKA healed and then just go behind the calf. You don't always have to do it from inside the wound. So um, no, healing first, TMR second. Awesome. Our next question is coming to us from David Chi. Terrific PRS Grand Rounds. How does the orientation of nerve coaptations differ when the goal is treating neuromas versus improving prosthetic control? Uh, wow, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, the principles of TMR are cut back to healthy fascicles, keep the reinnervation distance short, so bring the nerve coaptation near the denervated muscle. Um, that's kind of really about it. So maybe it doesn't matter too much other than when you're doing TMR for prosthetic control, you do want to separate the muscle areas a little bit. So I do separate them spatially. Sometimes I put a little adipofascial flap or just some free fat graft in between the muscles to physically separate two signals from each other. And you want a particular size, three, four, five centimeters, if you're using TMR for prosthetic control to make it easier for the prosthetist to pick up the signal. When you're doing it for prosthetic control, you want that recipient muscle to be, you know, the most superficial. You can't have it deep. While if you're doing it just for pain, you can use the pronator, even though it's deep, because you're not asking the you know, radial nerve, because you're not asking it to give a signal. So um, subtle differences, but I'd say that the nerve coaptations are more similar than dissimilar. Great. Our next question is coming to us from Garrison Leach. He would like to know, um, in patients with TMR that still report residual pain, have you noticed any differences in initial injury etiology, like an injury that's more a true transection versus something more evulsive? I think we would all agree that getting outside of a zone of injury is important. So if you have an evulsive injury, 
and you're downstream of a nerve that's been partially avulsed upstream, that's not a good situation. So I would say yes, an avulsive injury that may be tracked up toward the neck um, is not going to do as well as a sharply cut nerve. However, um, and uh, uh, patients that report residual pain tend to have their pain longer. And even though I'm not a big believer in centralized pain, I mean, a few of my um, failures have all had 10 or 15 years of chronic horrible pain. And especially when their residual limb is shaking, that's a sign that something is centralized and there's some reverberating signal mechanism. I, I don't know what it is, but I always worry about the patients who have a shaking of their limb. It's in so much pain that there's a there's a shaking. That's all I can describe it. Um, and then, uh, uh, but overall, 25% of amputees have no pain. 25% of amputees have horrible pain. This is uh, uh, Dr. Miatan Connor's paper. So it is more a patient intrinsic factor than a mechanism of injury. And I'm really convinced of that. So I hope I answered that. Awesome. Our next question is coming to us from Samarth Gupta. He would like to know, how do you manage the size discrepancy in lower limb coaptation when using the sciatic nerve to prevent neuromas? Um, you know, that's, I've been answering this question 20 years. Uh, giving even part of the nerve somewhere to go and something to do is important. And bringing that major mixed nerve near where the motor nerve goes into the muscle may be important because if there's, some, if there's a block of denervated muscle and there's this major mixed nerve nearby, it's going to suck up those axons. That's the way I think about it. In all of my years, I can only think of one, I mean, in all the hundreds and hundreds of coaptations, one or two areas where I was convinced that the coaptation site was painful. Now, Ian Valerio and uh, um, Kyle Eberlin have started doing a combination RPNI TMR where they take a block of muscle that was already denervated because the motor nerve was cut and they use, they make a little flap of that and they wrap the coaptation site in this piece of denervated muscle. I, I've done that a couple times. I'm, I'm just not convinced that my failures uh, of the procedure are due to nerve escape. But, you know, uh, this is a relatively newish procedure and lots of smart people are working on it and we will have technical advances over the years. So how do I manage the size? I don't use nerve wraps. I don't do anything other than I put the nerves together and I shorten the reinnervation, just the, the, le the, the length of the motor nerve before it goes into the muscle and no tension. Awesome. Our next question comes to us from uh, Raj Parikh and he would like to know as many others in the chat, what your thoughts are on RPNI versus TMR. The question we all knew is coming. Well, uh, and it's being recorded. Hi, Paul. Uh, hi, <laughs> um, you know, RPNI and, and TMR are brothers or cousins. They are not clansmen trying to fight each other. So, you know, RPNI has the same sorts of concepts of TMR that when the muscle comes back to life in the revascularization process, it's going to sprout nerve receptors. And during that process, the nerve is healing in a different kind of way. TMR is standard nerve nerve surgery and reinnervating a denervated block of muscle, while RPNIs have to have a revascularization process. Is it technically easier with an RPNI? I personally don't think so. As soon as you have a good nerve stimulator and you have some knowledge of motor nerve anatomy, and it bothers me to take a nerve and to split it into segments, trying to improve the ratio of muscle versus nerve fascicles. So, you know, I would do RPNIs if I don't have a motor nerve nearby, and I'd have to do gymnastics to find a motor nerve. I'll do an RPNI, but for me, I do two stitches of polypropylene, and I can, you know, finish a nerve coaptation. And uh, I think it's easier than doing an RPNI and the muscle taco and wrapping and getting it in the center and then dunking it. And so, but RPNIs work. I think that I would love 
a comparative study and I have this thing called the Zing Pain app so that uh, people can have a uniform platform for measuring nerve outcomes. There's no charge for it. Uh, if you want, just write to me and I'll get you uh, all the information so how you can start using this to measure postoperative pain outcomes in these nerve patients. So we can directly compare the results of an RPNI versus the results of a TMR. Awesome, definitely will be great study. Our next question comes to us from Gregory Nichols. He says, thanks so much. Um, what is the next step of your study with all these convincing results? How will you um, revolutionize even more prosthesis movements using this new technology? Um, it'll be a combination of osseointegration, so better stability of the prosthetic to the limb, and then either getting the nerve signal through wires through the abutment of the osseointegration or some sort of uh, transosseous wire, which I just don't know if the FDA will ever allow us to do because the finer the wire, the less the foreign body response, but then the more likely they're going to break. So, you know, or some sort of revolutionary prosthetic where you can beam out the signal. So uh, it's, it's going to be a electrical engineering solution to this problem. Awesome. Our next question um, comes to us from Matt MK. He highlights um, a P another PRS study which showed significantly significant improvements in multiple different pain metrics after using TMR. Um, for symptomatic neuromas and non-amputees. The one thing didn't significantly change was narcotic usage. Can you comment on your experience with how narcotic usage changes pre and post-operatively in TMR patients, in your experience? You know, um, I, I'm just, I would be talking from the land of anecdote. I don't have any pain management team. It's just me and my nurse. Um, we are not, you know, huge script writers and in general, uh, the narcotic use with proper counseling and coaching goes down, but uh, I'm not going to go against the published literature because I don't have any uh, data of my own. But with promise, you know, there's pain intensity, there's pain behavior, and then there's pain interference. With pain behavior being the slowest to improve with the in, with uh, changes in the baseline pain, so it could be that when the study was done. Again, the, if you look at PROMIS, Patient Reported Outcome Measurement Information System, pain behavior is the slowest to change. And it could be just, you know, learn behavior, People, you know, like smoking, you know, and you you just have this desire to have something in your, uh, between your fingers as you're talking. You know, you know, you feel like you have to wake up and take a narcotic. So, um, but I, I'm not an expert in narcotic pill usage. All right. Our um, next question comes to us from Muriu. He says, in upper limb amputees, how are the prosthesis program to understand the intended action given the variability in targets of TMR? So I'm going to take that up into two pieces. The variability in targets is figured out by the prosthetist. So they say, and they have a, you know electric sensor, and they say, close your hand. They can first see where the muscle is moving, and then they look and see where the electric signal is strongest. They go, boom, that's the close hand signal. No matter what the surgeon did, but that's where I would have transferred the median nerve. But in terms of the next step is that it's, it's very complicated and I've actually never done it myself, but there's an avatar and the avatar is doing different hand grasps and different motions. And the patient is trying to think about doing the motions he sees the avatar do. And there are lots of electrodes on the arm, and it is measuring and recording what those EMG signals are. So an avatar closes elbow, closes hand, flexes elbow, closes hand, the avatar, that's the avatar, and then the patient is thinking about it, and the computer is recording what the EMG signal is. So that when you have your prosthetic on, when the prosthetic senses that pattern of signals, it's going to do that for the arm. And so that's how there's a connection of pattern recognition to arm movements. Great. 
Our next question is from Nelson Rodriguez. He would like to know if you could talk a little bit about coding for these procedures. Um, you know, uh, I'm at a university, so uh, I don't do my own coding, but these are all nerve transfers. Um, so they're standard stage one nerve transfer codes. And if I have a four limb amputee, sorry, a four nerve uh, procedure, it'll be four nerve codes. I typically won't, uh, I will call it a, uh, just a nerve transfer is the neurotomy and the, and the uh, coaptation. I'm not coding neuroma excision. If for some reason I'm digging out the neuroma, then I will code for the neuroma excision as well. Um, muscle grafts are unlisted codes. So if I do an RPMI, I, I'm pretty sure that's an unlisted code still. Okay. Um, and I think our last question as we wrap up tonight um, is from Anna Steve. She would like to know for avulsion type injuries, is there an optimal time for intervention that allows you to best identify the extent of the zone of injury? So are there some uh, cases where delayed is preferable to an immediate TMR? No, uh, I think that if you were in the operating room and the donor loss of losing a small muscle segment is low, then I would do immediate TMR and see how it goes. Though with the, as you're following the patient, you say, gosh, I don't know how high your nerve injury went and we did this and we'll have to see if, and see how your outcome is. And if the outcome isn't successful, then I would, I, I've learned over the years to abandon the procedure I'd done previously for failure in three to six months. If it's not better in three, four, five months, it's not going to be better in a year. So I will now, I'm much more quick to go back and revise a nerve procedure because of a, uh, a poor outcome. So in this case, I would do the acute if the recipient target isn't going to cause a functional loss. And if it three, four months later, they're not thriving, then I would say, hey, you're really not thriving. I don't want this pain to set up chronically. Let's go higher and redo it. And I think that jumping in earlier has really helped my outcomes. Awesome. Well, I think with that, we'll wrap up our PRS Grand Rounds. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Dumanian for joining us. And thank you so much to everyone who participated and asked questions. I think it was a really great discussion. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks for involving me with PRS. All right. And as a reminder, the collection of free articles is available on the journal website.